Chapter 11, The Final Freakout. There are only two pages left to go, Dirk, Jean Betancourt said to the book in her lap. Not much space for a full-scale freakout. I can make more space. I assume you'll be the one doing the freaking out, yes? Oh, you'd better believe it. This book needs to be thrown into the river, and I'm going to impotently raise hell in here with my little words until you agree to do it for me. And I refuse to souse any but the last page, so that Anna and her friends can choose their fates for themselves. Souse is a good word. Yes. There was a brief moment of calm. Even the Lethe quieted its babble. Betancourt thought that maybe she could hear the pounding of Acorn's mighty hooves in the distance, but soon that was gone, too. This is it, isn't it? It's almost over. It's almost over. Endings are never easy, are they? Nope, which is exactly why I think we should bail right now. Follow my advice, erase the whole book, and it'll all be over here and now. No waiting around for the end. Your advice? Yeah. Okay, Dirk. You want to convince me? Go for it. But you have to let me choose where the conversation starts, okay? Fair enough. You know I like good back and forth. Good. Because it's about to get straight up dialogic in this bitch. Yes. You were talking about violence earlier, and that's where I want to start. All right. Hey, thanks for ditching the quotation marks. This is nice. You're welcome. Now, here's the thing. I think you're conflating violence with power, and power with control. You're asking yourself a question, but it isn't whether you've been violent to the book. It's whether you have control over it. Control? Yes. Control over the book? Right. In other words, it's a matter of uh, no. authority? Come on! You have to admit, that was pretty good. Yes, it was. Thank you. Now, I don't know if I agree with your premise. About me conflating these terms, okay, sure, violence doesn't equal power, although it certainly is the easiest way to assert it. And yes, I may have been using do violence to as shorthand for claim power over, but I don't follow your second step. How is power different from control? One can have power without using it, and one can use power to follow, not just to lead. But isn't that just leading from behind then, or at the least, loan in your power to the leader, the person who is actually in control? That's a really... Wait a minute. I'm going to add in some extra pages so we can keep this going. Fine. But you can't delay the end of the book forever. Here we go. Hang on. All right, we're here. Make it okay? Yeah. As I was saying, that's a pretty bleak worldview. One in which everyone's machinating and scheming and usurping and every act of control, which is to you every act, is one of violence. I shudder to think what self-control looks like under that system. What are you implying? That you desperately want to be in control of yourself, but you simultaneously fear it. Which is why you try not to think about it, and in fact can't think about it outside of completely absurd structures, such as the one we're in now. But I suppose you always were most comfortable with dialogues with yourself, weren't you? So you think that's what this whole book has been about? Dirk's Adventures in Fucked Up Ponyland, Volume 1, The Ethics of Control, illustrated by Paul Bacham? Not all of it, but yes, much of it. Here, look at the development that your character has had so far. Throughout the course of this book, you've been assigning yourself less and less control over it plot-wise. First, the characters start interjecting their own story into yours, supposedly without you noticing. Then they outright rebel against you, steal the book from you, literally and figuratively. They plot against you by turning the plot against you. And now, finally, you're trapped within this book in the book. A physical book in the context of the immaterial book, but an immaterial book in the context of the physical book, where you once more have control over its text, but an impotent control that has no consequences in reality, as much as the text I'm in now can be considered reality. In essence, you've returned to your starting point, only a layer deeper and a level weaker, the inferior copy of the copy of power, the mimesis of power, which is actually emblematic of powerlessness. Could be. And yet, as you play at stripping control away from yourself, you're actually hoarding it. Interesting. I want to revisit this later, but go on. I like where you're heading. As you, the character of Dirk, lose control, 
You, the external author, Dirk, gain it. When's the last time we saw any text from the original book other than chapter titles? Every paragraph you write lamenting your loss of control covers more lines of Detective Pony that we'll never see. And yes, in this case, your assertion of control is through violence. But that's assuming that I'm still the one writing this. Aren't you? You tell me. I'd love to, but I'm only able to say what you write me saying. I'm putting words in your mouth? It's your mouth. You're just calling it mine. What we're doing now. Is this the collapse of the meta-ness of the text, or is it going a layer deeper into it? Is it getting flatter or thicker? You tell me. <laughs> Back to what you said a bit ago. That I play at control. It was a very deliberate choice of words. I both love and hate these nebulous literary concepts. Difference. Trace play. That one in particular has been sneaking in for a while now and becoming more and more prominent, and I have no idea what that signifies, if anything. I think you do. Play is something that both cannot and must be taken seriously. Either it is opposed to logos, or it is the very thing that allows it to be. Play has no essence of its own and cannot be affirmed without being negated. As soon as play comes into being and into language, it erases itself as such. And isn't that, I mean, aren't all those things what this book is doing, especially now? You mean I'm trying to have it both ways? I'm trying to have this book be both playful and serious, and fighting against the possibility of it being playfully serious, and so it's ripping itself apart? Well, no. I mean, like you said, it's a nebulous concept. I just think that if you'd opened yourself to the possibility of play earlier, things might have gone differently. I should have treated this as a game. Not as a game. Yes, precisely. Is it a game now? Well, at a point, the game should appear to stop. That's one of the game's rules, and that's when we can hunt down that hidden chain of signification, which you, in your role as an author, if such a thing even exists, shouldn't be able to see, at least not as such. But since you're also a character, I think we can let it slide this time. How generous of you. Let's go back to the Pharmacon. In Derrida's essay that you're so fond of plagiarizing... You've read it? Dirk. There's more to my life than just children's stories about ponies. My first book was a feminist critique of contemporary short films. <laughs> I didn't know that. Maybe I'll read it sometime. Anyway. Derrida claims that one of the most important words in Plato's Phaedrus is a word that's not even in it. Right. The chain of signification begins with a reference to pharmacia and travels through other related words like pharmacon. But Plato never mentions pharmakos, the scapegoat, which is what his text is implicitly entirely about. Even if it escapes the notice of Plato himself, it nevertheless passes through certain discoverable points of presence that can be seen in the text. Yes. And you've copied Plato's exact chain, or copied Derrida's copy of Plato's chain, but with one difference. You did mention pharmakos because your text is very explicitly about sacrifice. And you mentioned pharmacia and pharmakon, both as remedy slash cure, and even in its secondary meaning as paint. No, the word you left out, your invisible link, is pharmakius, sorcerer. Oh, the powerful one, <laughs> the one in control. Exactly. So the absence of pharmacius reflects my uncertainty about who is really in control of my own book. Back to control again. Back to control again. See my point? What exactly are you saying I'm afraid of? Of not being in control? Of being in control? Or of the uncertainty? All three. I thought you'd say that. But here, in this book, right now, you are afraid of taking control. Of being the invisible pharmacius at the other end of the chain. You say that you want to erase this book by throwing it into the River Lethe. But come on, you don't need to do that. You could erase it yourself. You, the author. You could burn it, or tear it up, or hell, you could just stop writing it. But you're choosing to act through Dirk the character, and trying to convince me, who is still you, to symbolically destroy it. Even though, ironically, I couldn't destroy it in this way without you creating more of it. You need to write me destroying it. I really do want to erase it. Everything I said earlier was true. I just, I guess that that's not the only thing I want is all, or only part of me wants it. We both know you well enough to know that you can't just abandon it. It's not what you do. You always take your projects too far and make them so hard for yourself, but you complete them regardless. Or maybe you even complete them because they're so hard. You're a masochist who creates problems for yourself just so you can be the one who solves them. You're not telling me anything I don't already know. So you need to finish it. And you could right now. 
Jean Betancourt hurled the book into the river. That's all you need to write. That exact sentence again without the quotation marks. So why don't you write it? Yeah, it, um... This book's gotten out of hand. It's grown bigger than I intended, more complex, and I don't think that I can just end all of that so abruptly. Does that imply you think this book has some sort of life of its own beyond what you gave it? That in playfully making your character self-aware, you made them aware of play and somehow made them real? In a sense, at least. When you put it like that, it sounds really stupid, doesn't it? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but the problem is that I've already wrapped up so much bullshit along with the rest of the book. Any parts of it that are worth saving are mixed up with all my insecurities and self-importance and self-loathing. I can't take any of those parts back now. Like I said, I don't want Jane to see that. <laughs> Hell, I don't want to see that. So preserving this book would mean preserving all of that along with it. Would it be merciful to put it out of its misery, destroy it so that it doesn't have to shoulder the onus of all the horseshit from my own brain that I pumped into it? Or is that my selfishness talking, disguising itself as self-abasement? Now we're getting to the other big issue at the heart of things. Responsibility. Okay, yeah, I get it. We don't need to talk about that one in detail here. No, Dirk, I think that we do. You created something that in your mind is in some way alive, in some way self-conscious. And you're human enough to realize that you can't just kill it. I never said that. But if you don't destroy it, you need to take responsibility at some point. I'm not saying you are or should be responsible for it now, but take responsibility for creating it. Take responsibility for disassembling something else in order to create it. If you destroy it, you'll need to take responsibility for that. If you keep it alive, same deal. You need to think it over and decide for yourself to what degree you're responsible for each of those acts. Why can't it be responsible for itself? Can it be? That's something else you need to decide. Are, are you still talking about the book? Yes. If you're talking about something else, that's coming from your end, not mine. If you say so. Here's another way to consider responsibility in this book. Think about all the other texts that you've quoted or paraphrased or alluded to. What about them? You love to pull them in, but you very rarely identified or attributed them. Well, it's hardly an illusion if you pinpoint the source in MLA format, is it? But it's not how you use them, it's how you eventually punished yourself for them. When Anna started channeling characters from the works to which you alluded, that was the one thing more than any other that led to your downfall, your self-inflicted loss slash gain of narrative control. So I was shirking the responsibility of history, literature, trace by being obstinate and obtuse recitation. And then I forced myself to take responsibility, which made me lose control. Either that, or you were taking on unnecessary responsibility with your illusions. And it was only when you relinquished that responsibility that you were able to regain control. I imagine that if I ask you which one it is, you'll say both. Good imagination. Okay. So we've established that I feel some responsibility, deserved or not, for preserving this text, for letting it live. That there's a part of me, at least, that can't stop writing it for reasons that go beyond obsession. But here's the problem. I've painted myself into a corner where preserving this book means facilitating a plan to destroy it. You mean Anna's plan? Yeah. The narrative is hurtling toward the moment of her plot's realization. Its manifestation as plot as such. It has so much momentum at this point. And I don't think that I can change its course with anything short of a the end. If I keep writing, it'll inevitably result in Anna wiping the slate clean. So wouldn't it be better that I do the wiping myself on my own terms? But that's not what Anna's plan is about. It was never about wiping the slate clean. Weren't you paying attention to what you were writing? The terminology is important. It's not Operation Tabula Rasa. It's Operation Palimpsest. What's the difference? Tell me, what does Tabula Rasa mean? Blank slate, idiomatically. A scraped tablet, literally. Just like a palimpsest. Not quite. The Romans would write on wax tablets, then melt the wax before scraping it so the tablets could be reused, leaving no trace of the original text. <laughs> a palimpsest is just the opposite, though. No melting. Even on the most thoroughly scraped palimpsest, both texts are readable. The erased text might be incredibly faint, sure, but it's still there. A palimpsest is nothing but trace. So it's either my best or my worst case scenario, depending on which part of me you ask. Does Anna know about this aspect of her own plan? If you don't know whether she does, I don't know either. Hmm. And this is where the third big concept comes into play. Can't wait to hear what it is. Before I tell you, will you leave these insert pages and go back into the book with me? 
Are you ready to do that, Dirk? I guess so. I need to face the end eventually. Good. Let's go. Trapped again. No more or less than before, really. I guess you're right. So what's this third big concept? We've got control, responsibility, and... Uh... Choice. This book's also about giving others, and even yourself, the freedom to make choices, and more importantly, trusting them in their own choices, and accepting that their choices might not be the ones you want them to make. Fits nicely with the other two themes you've identified, doesn't it? You're saying that I'm so controlling of others that I strip them of the ability to make their own choices, and I can avoid responsibility for any consequences because I can claim that they made the choices that led to said consequences, not me. I'm still talking about the book, not about you. But if you are me, isn't talking about the book talking about yourself, which is myself? Are you even listening to yourself? To yourself? To you? Which is to say, to me? Which you yourself say to me as I say it to you? I'll never stop being amused by how quickly you retreat into your words when you feel threatened. I'm not saying you're wrong. So, with the idea of choice in mind, I have to ask, what now, Dirk? What do you mean? I mean, tell me what you want me to do with the book. I'm letting you make a choice. Whatever you decide, I'll do it. So do you want to erase the whole thing? Or just clear the way to the page that Anna needs in order to scrape the palimpsest so that her group may make their choice. Shit. This is hard. Can I have more time to think about it? Nope. I'm holding the book above the river now. All the pages, or just the one? There's sort of a lot going on in my head right now, Jean. Isn't there always? More than usual. This page is almost over. This is our last scene. Do you really want to waste it with self-aggrandizing introspection? It's what I'm best at. Choose. Right now. Take responsibility. And you decide what that means. Damn it. I can't think of an appropriate quote for the occasion. Whatever. You're right. Let's do it. I created Anna, and now I need to trust her. Jean, get that goddamn paper off the last page. Anna, good luck. Scrape this fucker. I hope I'll see you again, Dirk. Happy reading. Jean Betancourt. Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.